Today we're going to look at this. It's the key grinder from Weber Workshops. It's their latest grinder and it has been the subject of a lot of discussion and debate. We're going to break the review down into a few different sections. To start with, I'll talk through the history and inception of this grinder and ultimately its launch. Then we'll discuss the grinder itself, the features, what it comes with, what you get for your money. Then we'll dive into some of the claims of the grinder. We did some objective testing to kind of marry up with my subjective opinions of whether these things that they talk about, these innovations, well, whether they work. We're going to talk about workflow, the start to end process of pulling a shot of espresso or making filter coffee. After that, we will do a brief comparison to the Niche Zero, and then I'll wrap it all up in a summary, give you my final thoughts, tell you who I think this grinder is really for and for whom it may not work out. Let's start at the beginning. The grinder originally launched on Indiegogo and received a little bit over two and a half thousand backers paying $1,650 as the kind of base price. And that was a discount against the now retail price of $2,000. Now, Weber don't make cheap coffee grinders. We've discussed a couple of their grinders in the past on the channel. The EG1, which I liked so much that I ended up buying one for me, and the HG1, which is a hand grinder. This is almost the electrified version of that hand grinder. A lot of the same features, the same burr set inside, but a very different workflow and experience that we'll get into. Let's walk through the grinder just quickly now, uh, and then we can understand the kind of key features and ideas behind it. Now at the heart of this grinder, in the middle here, are a set of 83 millimeter conical burrs sourced from Matza. Those are a big burr set, and Weber say they are partially seasoned. Essentially brand new burrs don't cut efficiently or effectively compared to burrs that have been used for a little bit, and so that process of grinding a bunch of coffee that will be substandard or below optimal is called seasoning. They may be partially seasoned, but I've definitely seen an improvement in coffee quality over time. Uh, this has had a good amount of coffee through it now uh, and is making, I think, very good drinks, but we'll come to that. So you have these conical burr sets. They sit actually below the sort of dosing funnel. Now this is sort of trapped in place here, but below it, you can see the burr set in here. And they've got a coating on them too that should improve their longevity, though in almost every case, most domestic users won't go anywhere near the lifespan of a well-made burr set. They're really built for cafes first and foremost that'll be grinding hundreds, if not thousands of kilos of coffee in a year. Now, if I turn it sideways here, you control the motor's RPM with this dial here. It runs from 30 RPM up to 150 RPM. That's a pretty low RPM range and a very interesting decision that I think has had some benefits and some drawbacks. There's a whole section on this though, don't you worry. Next to it is a nice design detail. There's a little brush that sits there for keeping things clean. That slides back in to make it easy to put back in. And the on off button. Here is what's called the magic tumbler. It's a couple of different pieces all put together. It's magnetically attached to the body and it drops down. And here you have uh, the sort of Weber uh, dosing funnel. This has a central piece that when full of coffee, you pull it up, coffee falls out of the bottom, and it's pretty easy to dose directly into your porter filter or into your filter brew or whatever you're using. The additional magic piece to this tumbler is this small paperclip looking thing just here on the grinder. As the grinder runs, it spins and stirs and declumps the grounds as they're grinding. Does it work? We'll find out. The last thing to talk about is the grind adjustment mechanism. This grind adjustment is stepped. And for some people, that's a kind of deal breaker. They want infinite adjustment. They want real granularity. The adjustments are apparently about five microns in size. In my experience, I've had no issues getting the grind to be what I want it to be, to get the flow that I want, to get the extraction that I want. I have found this to be adequate control uh, and I've never found myself moving between steps, trying to chase a gap in between them. To adjust the grinder, you lift this collar here, but not all the way up, and then you move it either coarser or finer. This adjustment mechanism is a little bit clunky, if I'm honest. I don't really like the fact that you can lift it off this piece here and then you've got to try and awkwardly put it back on. I don't like the fact that if you were to not lock the mechanism back properly and run the grinder with a little bit of coffee in it, the direction the burr turns would essentially drag the adjustment mechanism finer and finer and finer to the point that you would likely seize the burrs together. For me, that's quite a flaw in this particular product design. It may never happen to most people, but to the one person that it does happen to, they're in for a fairly miserable time as they try and unseize those burrs. That's not gonna be an easy thing to do. You do get 
a dosing cup with your grinder. This isn't great either. This feels significantly cheaper than everything else. Uh, and I will say the build here on my unit has been excellent. I have no flaws or issues. You might see a couple of scuffs and scratches on the grinder because of a small accident in the studio that was my fault. That's not an issue with Weber. That's an issue with me. The dosing cup. It's a little bit too thin. It's annoying to dose into. It feels cheap. It can sit after dosing just there. You also get with your grinder a little spray bottle. If you're not familiar with the RDT, uh, there's a whole video I made on that whole thing here. Spray bottles are good and definitely recommended with this particular grinder, giving your beans a little misting of water before you grind them. Now, my grinder came with the full set, which means that I got an additional funnel and an additional tumbler. If you don't want to use the magic tumbler, then you can take this piece off. You can remove the kind of paperclip holder and replace it with this piece here, and then insert a funnel that would sit just underneath here, and then this catch cup sits magnetically on the base there. I will say that the experience of using this thing, having the magnet hold it in place, is satisfying in the way that I wanted the fellow odes to be, but it really wasn't. This very satisfying magnet there. And that's what you get for your $2,000, well, or a little bit more actually, if you pay for the additional tumbler sets. I'll go ahead and say right now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the additional sets unless you have a very specific need for them. Uh, I, I definitely preferred the Magic Tumbler. Now, before we move on, we have to just touch briefly on the design decision that I think is the most controversial in this whole grinder, and that's to mount the moving burr at the end of a long drive shaft that is not stabilized near the burr. In theory, if this shaft moved out of alignment, it would, it would take very little to have a significant impact on sort of the burr alignment between the outer burr and the inner burr. Weber say that this is not an issue. Some people have reported that they've had alignment issues. I'll leave some other reviews and other links down below. While I have had no issues with alignment, I've had no issues with extraction or, or flavor, it is a cause for concern in the very long term or just something I would be aware of. It's an interesting decision. It's an aesthetic decision. It leaves you with this piece that you can't take off that annoys me. It's a risk. Is it worth it? That's a difficult question to answer. So let's talk about testing those claims uh, of the various different innovations within the grinder. Firstly, let's talk about retention. This is sold as a sort of low or zero retention grinder. And I would say on one particular condition, uh, that's actually pretty true. As long as you're using an RDT spray, a little bit of water to mist the beans before you grind them, I have found it to be a very, very low retention grinder. By and large, I've gotten out exactly what I've put in. Once in a blue moon, there's been a small amount of variance, but it has been very, very, very low. But I, I will say, I don't weigh the output when I'm using it because I'm confident that if I put 18 or 20 grams of coffee in, that's what I get out. So from that perspective, it has worked extremely well across probably 50 different tests where we measured in and out. So let's talk about one of the big features of this grinder, which is the magic tumbler. Does that little paperclip mechanism, that little wire for kind of, kind of phrase, does that work? Does that declump the grounds? Does that improve your espresso? To sort of understand it or to test this, we created a little matrix of shots. So we devised four tests. Number one, standard tumbler, no needle distribution. Number two, standard tumbler with needle distribution. Number three, magic tumbler, no needle distribution. And number four, magic tumbler with an additional needle distribution. Broadly speaking, the magic tumbler works. It is definitely better than no distribution, and it's nearly on par with no distribution from a grinder and then using a manual tool. When I particularly compared the Magic Tumbler versus the Magic Tumbler with an additional distribution, I saw a small improvement with additional distribution. That's both in uh, sort of overall extraction that very slightly increased, very slightly, and a small reduction in variance. Essentially, it became a little bit more consistent. So if you want the absolute best out of this grinder, I would recommend adding a, a sort of stirred stage to the end, because ultimately this does a very good job of declumping, of fluffing the grounds. And that's good. That's one part of what you're trying to do here. The second part is really make sure that you've distributed the ground coffee in the portafilter basket as evenly as possible. What we have here is very fluffy grounds in the kind of dosing funnel ready to go. I think they look nicely declumped. That's good. I can give them a little shake if I want to before I put it on top of my portafilter and lift the central column up. And then to just sort of 
make sure everything's in place, you can do a little movement like that. You'll see Weber themselves recommend a, a technique like this. The distribution in the basket is pretty good. But the truth is, a needle distributor will help you improve that fractionally. And I think that's where I was seeing the increased consistency and the increased extraction, just doing a very slightly better job of evening out that bed of coffee before I tamped it and brewed it. While there is room for improvement, I think it's taking you quite a long way there. I think it's doing a, a good job, if not a flawless job. And for many people who don't wanna have one more tool or, or go through that entire process, it's, it's taking you a long way towards good puck prep in an automated way that works reasonably well. Next up is the variable RPM. As I said at the start, the RPM choices here are, are really pretty low. 30 RPM is a really, really slow moving burr set. And that has presented some challenges. Ultimately with lighter roasted coffee beans that are much more dense, uh, grinding at very fine grind settings, that's a lot of work. And it's even more work when you're trying to do it very slowly, you need a lot of torque. I have suffered, and I think a number of other testers have suffered similarly, trying to grind very, very, very finely, espresso finely, with very light roasted coffees, has caused the motor to stall. This is an irritating experience, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you have to try and find a way to overcome that. In some cases, you can crank the RPM back up higher. In other cases, you might need to adjust the grinder coarser to, to make the whole thing easier, and then to grind out the dose that you've kind of halfway gotten through. The interesting thing to note from my testing was that when stalling happened, it tended to happen after a number of shots pulled back to back. And often it seemed to be the kind of workload more than the grind setting. A number of times, not long after we'd moved the grind setting a little bit coarser, that's when the grinder had stalled. Which seems kind of weird. That should be easier than it was at a finer setting, and yet I was having issues. So I presume uh, an issue was essentially a buildup of heat around the motor, causing it to have the safety mechanism that kicks in that stops it being damaged by, by trying to work too hard or harder than it's rated to work. To give you an idea of the coffee that we used, this is a, a single origin coffee from Rwanda. It's pretty dense, pretty high grown, really pretty light for espresso but it did cause the grinder some issues. At higher RPMs, really above 90, and it goes up to 150, in that upper half, I've never had issues of stalling uh, at any coffee that I've used for any particular grind setting. It's really just that low RPM stuff. So what, you might ask, is the benefit of low RPM? That's a very good question. Uh, and so what I did is I dialed in a coffee at 90 RPM, and then I started to pull shots at varying RPMs to see what the impact on brew time and cup quality was. The results were surprising, because you'll hear a lot of people talk about the Barista Hustle research that said lower RPM produces less fines. And so what you might expect would be a lower RPM at the same grind setting to produce a faster shot. It's got less fines, it should flow faster. But the opposite occurs. Same again, when you crank up the RPM, I found my shots across different coffees flowed faster. That seems contrary to Barista Hustle's work, but in terms of taste, well, that lined up a little bit more. Generally speaking, shots at higher RPMs have the taste of uh, more texture, more body, less clarity. They're a little softer, more muted than the kind of clearer, more linear shots that you would get out of very low RPMs. So from a taste perspective, it does line up, but something else beyond fines production is happening at different RPM. Uh, it seems like the, the overall peak is being moved. I don't have a, a laser analyzer for coffee grounds, and if I did, this would be a fascinating grinder to test with that. Maybe at some point in the future we can make that happen, but for now, I remain a little bit confused by the outcome. It's an interesting feature. I'm not 100% sold in the execution here, I think variable RPM is gonna be a thing that we see more and more of in the future as we begin to understand the actual impact. But at this stage, this is a decent implementation, but not perfect by any stretch. And I would hope this is something that has changed and improved in future models. Let's talk workflow. Let's talk the use of this thing daily. Is it a delight or is it a frustration? And if I'm honest, it's a little bit of both. Let's make some coffee and I'll talk you through my particular issues with how this grinder works. Firstly, I think this lid doesn't really work well. It helps stop a little bit of popcorning that happens. Uh, popcorning where fragments of beans bounce out of the burrs. This does help prevent that, but it also creates a very annoying problem. You can't see the little dosing funnel to see that all of the beans have essentially fallen in. When you spray coffee beans, they get a little bit sticky. 
And that means they won't necessarily fall in from the funnel properly. They might need a little assistance with your finger to poke them down. If your lid is on, you can't see which ones are still stuck without taking the lid off, which sort of negates the whole lid. So for almost the entire duration of me using this grinder, I have not used the lid and I have not used this dosing cup because I just don't, I don't like weighing coffee into it. I don't like using it. It just doesn't work for me. So having sprayed the coffee, I have preferred to give the grinder a kind of hot start where the grinder burrs are running before I load the coffee in. This is perhaps a fear of stalling that's just built this particular workflow for me, but it has obviously created less issues. So generally I would recommend it. I think ultimately a lot of my beef with the workflow stems from this one piece of the grinder here. Now this is trapped in place. I can't take this off at any point. It would have been a much more Weber piece of design to split this in half, put some magnets in it and let me click it apart and click it together again so that I could take it off if I wanted to. This whole grinder, as you can tell, is built with a very small footprint. It's very narrow in that regard, but I feel like you could have used a little bit more width to take advantage of an angle to better feed coffee beans in. So uh, I feel like frustratingly, you could come up with a third party solution for this piece, but putting it on is nigh on impossible because of the design of the grinder. From this point onwards, the workflow is pretty decent. Like I said, I've gotten on pretty well with the Magic Tumbler. It's not flawless, but it works pretty well. But let's make some espresso. It's very tasty. The key thing that everyone wants to know is how is the, the kind of coffee out of this? As I said, I've had no real issues getting the extractions that I would want or expect from this. I have rarely gone all the way to max RPM. I've preferred to sort of live in the middle and try and live a hybrid life of a little bit of clarity, a little bit of texture. It's capable of making great espresso of different styles. Now, as I put this back together, you'll be aware that I have to pay attention to my little paperclip thing. That is, again, a, a bit of a ding on the workflow. With the HG1, the hand grinder that had the same sort of system, that piece was gonna be in one of two positions and that made life a little bit easier. Here, it could be anywhere on the sort of 360 rotation, which means a part of your brain has to pay a bit of attention, have a bit of a look when you're putting it back together again. It's not a joyful, fluid experience. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's notable. It's something you find yourself paying attention to and wishing a little bit that you didn't have to. Now, I said this whole grinder review was not gonna be a direct comparison with the niche, but I think it would be helpful and instructive for me to pull the same recipe with the same coffee on the same equipment with the niche and give a kind of benchmark of how those flavors and textures are different. It's a surprisingly different shot from the niche. It's a heavier shot. It's a little bit more texture. It lacks a little bit of clarity in comparison. It lacks a little bit of brightness and sort of top end to it. If you've got a niche at home and you're pulling shots, you're probably having a great time if you're doing a good job. This is tasty. This is a different style of espresso, even at the highest RPMs where it's the sort of most kind of conical expression in a way. I think it's a different style of espresso, very slightly. The niche is gonna be, uh, I think, uh, probably a broader particle size. And you taste that, and for better or worse, you get a bit more texture, you get a little less clarity, and that's okay. That's sometimes a worthwhile trade-off. That isn't to say the texture from this hasn't been good. I've had very nice feeling espresso from this when it's, it's really been sort of dialed in and singing, but it's a different sort of beast to the niche. And so I'm sort of hesitant to kind of come back and compare over and over these two grinders. So let's touch on filter coffee, because while I see this as an espresso forwards grinder, a lot of people would want it for filter coffee. In my experience, I was moving the, the dial about a full rotation to go from espresso to filter coffee. But bear in mind that we brew 30 to 40 grams at a time here rather than a single cup. So your mileage may vary. That process is a little bit awkward. You, you know, like lifting this, if I move it from nine all the way around, seven, about where I last was, it's fine. It's repeatable, I can move back to where I was without much in the way of issues, though I would recommend a little purge of coffee through first, just to make sure that your coffee brews as you would want it to once you start dialing in properly. But that's not a difficult thing. The settings have been repeatable. Settings haven't moved, so to speak, between day-to-day -day kind of brews. Generally, I've been sort of grinding at these lower RPMs because in filter coffee, 
I prize clarity above texture, and I'm willing to sort of make that particular sacrifice. And I think those characteristics do reflect in the filter coffee a little bit, the way that they do in espresso, though I don't think it's as obvious to, to most people. I know we were just talking about the niche, and so in comparison to the two, I think it makes better filter coffee than the niche. I think if you like clarity, more than you like texture in your filter coffee. Here, I, I think I do ultimately prefer that clarity, that sweetness from this particular grinder when everything is dialed in just right. So let's summarize my feelings about the Weber Workshop's key grinder. Reviewing this grinder gave me a small philosophical crisis. As many of you know, the reviews on this channel are supported by Patreon. They give me a budget every month to go and buy these things like a normal person. I don't take review units, I just buy them and give you an, a, a kind of unbiased review ideally. At the end, I give it away in a contest to one of my Patreons. That's done on Patreon. If you ever see anyone in the comments looking like me telling you you've won something, you haven't, it's a scam, ignore it. Anyway, this is a $2,000 grinder, and that is a staggering amount of money. Now, I paid $1,650. Still, that's a lot of money too. That's a lot of money. But because it wasn't my money, initially, I had a kind of detachment from the price. And thinking about it made me pay a lot more attention to the price. What if this was my money, my hard-earned cash coming out of my pocket? How would this change my relationship with this product, with this whole experience? Targeting the niche, I think, was a good idea. The niche demonstrated a huge demand for a certain style and experience in the world of grinding. And I think by looking at it on paper and taking each of the features and improving upon them, they've missed the wider experience of the niche. Going back to my original review of the niche, I think the word I used was charming. Something about the workflow, the use of the whole thing, was pleasing to me in a way that I think caught me off guard. In addition, what surprised me about the niche was the industrialization process that they had succeeded in. Most people struggle to scale up, going from a prototype to mass manufacture. Turns out, the founder of Niche, that's what his whole career had been doing for other people, and so not surprising he could do it for himself. But going from small run to big scale is really, really, really hard, and I think that has been uh, a challenge for Weber. Part of their appeal had been they made small runs of very beautiful, very exquisitely built grinders. This was their first foray into industrialized scale, into not mass production, but certainly, I would say, an order of magnitude more units than they'd done previously. That transition is painful for anybody, and I think Niche just got to learn that on someone else's dime, so to speak. My grinder has not had many issues, but I have seen other issues from other people, and I just think that is, unfortunately, part of that growth process. There's no shortcut. You just have to go through that as a manufacturer. Nobody starts out being good at hardware. Scale is painful. The combination of brand and price point set an expectation of small-scale build, of perfection in every single detail. And I think that's really hard to achieve when you're going through the kind of growth and scale that they are going through. I think this is a grinder where you have to decide what really, really matters to you. If footprint is incredibly important to you, this is desirable. If design and look and feel and materials are important to you, this does feel beautifully made. The details definitely feel there. On this unit, I have no reason to complain about a single piece of, of sort of manufacture or build. If you want a grinder that can do a few different things in terms of style, from a little bit more texture to a little bit more clarity, without being the extreme of either, then I think it's appealing. If you've got $2,000 to spend, then I suspect you're probably also looking at something like the, the Largom P64. And that's a worthy competitor. It's a little bit cheaper. You've got some more burr options. You have variable RPM. You don't have some of the extra features, but it, it is still a very, very nice grinder that I, I like a lot. And you have to decide what's more important to you, what is it that you want from your espresso making experience. I could see some people being very, very happy with their purchase. I can see others being frustrated and kind of annoyed. And what I've tried to do with this review is give you my subjective opinion, the things that I like, the things that I don't, as well as the objective, what works and how well it works. And with that information, I hope you can make an informed decision about whether this is the right grinder for you. Is it worth the money? I can't really answer that because I don't know what you need from your espresso grinder. If you look at the features, look at the performance, and see that marry up with what you need, then I think it's a great investment. If they don't match up, then no, it's not good value for money. That's the nature of any product out there. I think it's a very capable, very good grinder. 
I still think there's a couple of areas I'd like to see improvements in the future, but nothing comes out of the gate perfect. And I think if you're backing something as a pre-order from the very first run, you should always be aware, regardless of manufacturer, regardless of what you're buying, that you are essentially a little bit of a guinea pig. You're getting the first of something and there is a little bit of a risk with that, even from an established manufacturer. And that's not just Weber, that's anyone, anywhere, even at the biggest scale possible of hardware manufacturing. But now I want to hear from you down in the comments below. Do you have a key yet? Did you pre-order? Has it arrived? How are you getting on with it? How's the espresso tasting? How's the filter coffee? What's working for you? What do you wish were a little bit different? If you're shopping for a grinder, how does this figure into what you're looking for right now? I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.